Hello everyone and welcome to a very special episode of Bhai Na Salna on campus. We're here at the prestigious Bennett University in New Delhi. We have a, an entire hall of students who are from the MBA batch as well as undergraduates in finance and marketing. Our very special guest for the day who will be interacting with the students is someone who needs no introduction. A market veteran who's seen many bull cycles and bear alike and has a lot of experience in the stock markets and how to pick the right companies. Ramesh Damani, member of BSC. Without any further ado, let's get started. Well, Ramesh, we're right here in a classroom. Does this bring back memories as well of your education back in the day? Now so many more opportunities have opened up for students. What's the you know, first word of advice that you'd like to give them? Oman, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, you know, great to be back uh, in a university setting. I'm so old that you know, I don't remember my school days anymore. Uh, you know, I'm so old. My, I recently turned 60, guys. So my son told me, Dad, congratulations, you entered the wonder years. So I said, what do you mean? He said, you're always going to wonder where you parked your car, where you left your wallet, where you left your keys. I'm wondering if I should still pay for his education, Avan. <laughs> That's a question that you should ponder now. But uh, let's have the floor thrown open as well. But before we do that, Ramesh, let's talk about, you know, the world of the markets. And uh, you've seen a number of cycles. You've uh, had a lot of experience with how the equity markets have fared. And, you know, it's a question about timing, getting things at the right price. So what's the first key to investing in the stock markets or some notion that you'd like to dispel? Well, that's a great question to start you off with. And, you know, this is what I learned over 30 years of investing, and I'm giving it to you for free. The first answer I'm giving it to you, right? So this is what I found. When I came, uh, I, I went overseas, I studied, did my MBA, worked there, came back to India in 1989. The index was maybe six, 700. In fact, the base of the Sensex on April 1, 1979, which is exactly 40 years ago, was 100. Okay? From that level, it's close to 40,000 today. All right? So look at the journey of the Sensex from 100 to 40,000 over a period of uh, 40 years. It's been an extraordinary journey out here. And what is the one thing that I learned over great amounts of time? I mean, if you were investing in India in 1979, you would have come across with any number of difficulties. In India, was a closed economy. You had you know, minority governments, you had Indira Gandhi assassination, global financial crisis, demon, GST, name it. And yet the index has found a way higher. So here are the first two great lessons in life that you learn that the arc of human history is towards progress. Okay, so great businesses will find a way to make progress. And the way to become rich individually, which is what I think should concern everyone who's young in India, I don't think we should belong to the class that says there's gl we glorify poverty. I think we need to get rich in this world because we are in a capitalistic system. And the trick to doing that is compounding, is to understand what compounding is. Compounding is what the magic that makes you from merely rich to really wealthy. And I'll do this exercise with you because it's always fun. Let's say you're 25 years old, which most of you are just below that perhaps, and you manage to save your first 10 lakhs. Okay, you first you save 10 lakhs, and then you start investing the money. All right? Let's, and if you can double your money every three years, you're going to have 10 doubles in a 30 year career, about. that's what's pretty much happened. But the 10 doubles, that compounding the 10 doubles makes an extraordinary difference in your life. If you compound your money every three years, double your money every three years, you're growing at maybe 21, 22% compounded. If you start early, the trick is to start early, and invest in great businesses that can compound your money over periods of time. Look, the Sensex itself has compounded about 16% without dividends. I'm asking you to do about 20 to 23%. Use a bit more attention, a bit more uh, intelligence to compound your money at 20 to 23%. You do that, at the end of a 30 period, you're going to be richer than almost everybody you know. That's the trick of the stock market. The power of compounding, and we just saw that with your mathematical example. But the students, I know you guys have questions. I believe we have a question from a student in the second row there. Let's get started with you. Hi, sir. We've often heard that ETFs are one of the best passive instruments to invest into. But let's say everybody starts investing into it. So how would it be compared to investing into value stocks at a single point of time? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. but. I don't think we are at that point yet. I think ETF investing is fairly nascent in India. It's probably more better in, say, advanced countries where people do more ETF, do more index funds. And here are my two thoughts on that. The first is that if you are, you know, become a lawyer, say, for example, and you have no time for the stock market. Really, you're busy, you have a whole life to lead, children, whatever, family to run. I would suggest you invest in an ETF or a low-cost index fund 
because as I said, when the index was 100, it's gone up to 40,000 now. So you'll make the money that the index makes, which is okay for most people. It's better than doing a fixed deposit, better than investing in gold most of the time. You'll do all right. If you want to be a professional in the market, clearly you have ambitions to beat the market. So you want to invest in non-index, non-ETF fund. It's very difficult to do. But if a situation like that happens, if more than 50% of the people start investing in ETF fund, obviously, say they invest in a BSE 500 ETF, the 500 to 1,000 stocks have become fairly cheap. So you'll be able to find great bargains in that. So I would suggest if you're a professional, I don't think there's something to worry about. If you are uh, someone who's not involved in the markets, perhaps ETF index funds are not bad places to go because markets, like anything else, take a lot of time. So you need to spend a lot of time understanding businesses, understanding markets. When I gave that example of how you work your money by compounding, I don't want to suggest that it's easy because making money is never easy, but it's simple. That's the logic you need to use. A very simple, buy great businesses, stick to those great businesses. End of the 30 year period, if you've done things right, you'll end up rich. You know, you had also spoken about the circle of competence that you should look at sectors that you have a bit of knowledge about or that you dabble in yourself. Say, for instance, if you work in the banking sector, look at banking. So is that something that you advise as well that, you know, students or investors should keep in mind? Yeah, if you figure out compounding, then you want to say, what do you compound your money with? Avant, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, how do you decide? Every single day, there are 5,000 stocks that trade on the Bombay Stock Exchange, maybe 2,000 stocks on the National Stock Exchange. There are two things that you should remember out here, that unlike in a game of T20 where you're compelled to hit at every ball that comes and keep the scoreboard moving, in the game of the stock market, the stock market keeps throwing balls at you, ACC, Infosys, Wipro, Reliance, but you don't find them attractive, you don't have to play that ball, right? You wait for that ball or the price or the company, you know, the fat ball outside the off stump, full toss, which you can hit for a six. You can only hit at that ball. There is no time restrictions or ball restrictions as in IPL in the stock market. You take your time and choose your ball. So how do you choose your ball? You choose it within what I call a circle of competence, all right? So rather than say, if you're a software engineer, you go and bet on steel companies, which you may know nothing about, right? Or for example, you are a finance guy, you go and bet on real estate companies, which you may know nothing about. Stick to a circle of competence. Let's say you're a medical doctor, right? You may not know about software, you may not know much about steel, but you'll know for sure that India is going to become the diabetes capital of the world, that one in 10 Indians will have uh, diabetes once they cross 35, say for example. So you know the Indian population of billions, 100 million people are going to suffer from diabetes. How will they cure diabetes? They'll go to exercise gyms, they will take medicines, uh, insulin, they will uh, you know, adopt different lifestyles, high protein diets, low carb diet. So you can figure out the companies that are going to do this properly, which pharmaceutical companies are focused on diabetes problem, which is the exercise life chain that you want, which restaurants support better eating. So invest in those companies. You're better off doing that than investing in all the 5,000 companies that are listed on the stock exchange any given day, because that gives you superior insight. The, the proponent of the theory was a guy called Peter Lynch, who did just what Warren Buffett said, circle of competence. And he'd listen to his family. Where, where were his daughters shopping? What was his wife buying? I mean, a lot of people, how many of you wear a Titan watch out here? Can you raise your hands? Yeah, not that many. I'm, I'm surprised. Normally, I get more people than that. Titan has been one of the great stocks in India. It's been up almost 200x in the last 10 years, right? So if you just invest in what you buy, what you know, it's not as simple as I make it out. But if you start thinking in that line, that will give you huge insights into what you're so, doing. So we should find out what you're wearing top to toe and then invest accordingly. You should find out what my wife is wearing, which is Zara, right? So you invest in Zara if you can, you know? Yeah, definitely. And she's always there, so I'm in trouble. I'm Deep from MBA. So my question is regarding the recession that is expected in 2020. So go to any business news channel and you'll find that they're speaking out the recession and how it's going to affect the world economy. And it's, of course, it's going to affect India as well. But what we are seeing right now is complete opposite, that the Nifty 50 and the Sensex is going through the roof, okay? So they have crossed the resistance point and they have reached an all-time high. So do we really need to worry about the U.S. recession? Because if the market in the U.S. is really going to be less attractive, doesn't it mean better for India? Because the way the Nifty has crossed the resistance point was because of foreign uh, portfolio investors, almost a value of 51,000 crore has been invested in the Indian stock market. Should we be really worried about the recession? And second, if the recession is really going to affect us, when is the rally going to end? So this is my question. 
what are the economic factors that affect the stock market? Of course, the stock market is very sensitive to economic developments. So sometimes it will be the Fed rate that will affect the market. Sometimes it will be oil prices that affect the market. Sometimes it will be what happens in India that will affect our stock market, right? The problem is that you can't control these things. I mean, how do you anticipate a 9-11 happening? Or how do you anticipate oil prices doubling in six months? You can't anticipate these things. But as Avan asked me in the previous uh, question, if you have a circle of competence and you understand a business, you're far better off than trying to understand the markets. Greater minds than mine have tried to work on figuring out what's going to happen in macroeconomics. And my simple answer to you is don't waste your time. You can't figure it out. You might get one call right, you get three calls wrong after that, right? But you can focus on what a business is doing. You're going to focus, for example, how the technology business in India is going to do or how the cement cycle is working out. That you have some insight, that you can control, what the demand looks like, what the profit looks like, one, two, three years down the road. You have some, your better ability to estimate that. So I would say, especially when you're young, starting out your career, focus on a company rather than the big, broad macroeconomic picture because you'll do much better. You'll have a better understanding of, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that Apple is going to conquer the world. You know, once you were in America and you're part of the ecosystem, you kind of figured out, you know, the way people are buying the iPads and then the iPhones and then the iPads. You kind of figured out that Apple is going to be a huge company. A lot of my friends, for example, in America used to rent videos and then they realized they wanted to stream videos. So you knew blockbuster video is going to go down, Netflix is going to rise. So by using your consumer experiences on a day-to-day -day basis, you get some sort of uh, insights into behavior. India is going to become a consumer economy where people are going to finance purchase of durables, right? That's a pretty obvious trend that's playing out, whether you buy a 35-inch TV, whether you buy a washing machine. You know people are now financing this. So who are the major companies involved in that? Maybe that's a good place to look at. So rather than focus on the macro, I would focus on the micro. Try and find a company you understand, a business you love, run by integrous people, at a good valuation, that's the great starting point. All right, everyone's jotting down notes and is absolutely glued to the pearls of wisdom from Ramesh Damani. We're in the middle of BNSN on campus at Bennett University in Delhi. Take a quick break, come right back for more. Welcome back. Still tuned into Buy Now, Sell Now on campus. We're right here in New Delhi at uh, the Bennett University in conversation with market veteran Ramesh Damani. Lots of questions coming up from the students, so let's get right back to it and go ahead with your query. So much has been made about uh, small and mid-cap stocks because they show attractive movements as seen as percentage gains or losses. So how do we view small and mid-cap stocks as overall? Yeah. The there's a lot of futile debate that goes on. You know, you should buy large cap stocks, you should buy small cap stocks, the returns are better in small caps, the safety is better. I'm personally agnostic to it. I want to buy a good business. Uh, and as my friend told me once, that you want to buy a small cap stock that will become a large cap stock. That's the hope that we invest in. Uh, you know, at, at the end, investing is about buying a great business at a valuation you understand, and you're investing with good people. You know, where interests are aligned out there. So. If you find a small cap business that does that, that's great. I bought Lever when it's been cheap because it offered that opportunity, which is a fairly large cap stock in India. And I bought a lot of small cap stocks that have done very well to me also. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So you've got to be able to understand and do your homework as to why you're buying a business. Uh, I'll tell you the opportunities. Many years ago, the Indian liquor market was available for 200 crores. Now that is a small cap stock by any definition, 200 crores. But can you imagine the size of the Indian liquor market over a period of years? I mean, how big that was going to be? So sometimes the market misprices these things. So I would not necessarily label you know, small cap, large cap, and buy only one or the other. I would try and buy great businesses. I always believe, like I told you, liquor was a great business. And that the opportunities ahead as India liberalized and more people became of drinking age, it would represent a gusher of opportunity. So my advice to you is look for great businesses. and. Don't but, try and look Ramesh, at the label too much. if I may much. come in there, if there was some sort of a checklist that you have, how one can identify a good business where they know that when I go to sleep, I don't have to worry about it or just look at it over the next five years and not have to think about it. Where are you finding that opportunity and what's the sort of checklist to identify? Yeah, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> I wish it were. It isn't. But no, but I mean some certain parameters that one needs to look at. Here's what I would do. I mean, here's what the, the first entry point or first checklist is any business that you evaluate you try and first find out how is the market valuing that business right? that's your beginning point 
For example, I told you the liquor business in India was valued at $100 million in 2003. Now you could slap me at 2 o'clock at night, you could make me cross the Atlantic, I'd go and buy that business. How can India's liquor business be worth $100 million? I mean, it's it just with the 1.2 billion population, I know what the value of San Miguel in the Philippines was, I know what the value of King Beer in Thailand was, I know what Anaisa Bush was in uh, this thing. And here you have a country with a billion people, 50% below 21 years of age, and the entire liquor, beer business was available for $100 million, right? So the first entry point is how is the market valuing it? And then, what do you think it's worth? If you think, oh, I think this business is worth $5 billion, then I know I'm getting a deal, right? $5 billion is what I think it's worth, I'm getting for $100 million. So the first point, Avan, is always to do that calculation. What is the enterprise value that the market is placing to business, which is the market cap plus the debt? And what do I think the valuation of the business will be? And occasionally, you'll come up with surprising answers. Supposedly, if you're in your circle of competence, how can this be so cheap? It doesn't make any sense. It's just like you go bargain hunting for clothes, you go bargain hunting for stocks. When you find them cheap, you load up. Let's get in some more questions from the students. Go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Aritra Sen. I'm from the MBA batch of 2020. Uh, given the current situation in the economy and we're seeing what the government is going through, what would your comments be on the aviation sector stocks and defense sector stocks? I think aviation is going to do well. Uh, there's a joke Warren Buffett used to say uh, that uh, how do you become a millionaire? And the answer was you start by being a billionaire and start an airline. <laughs> so you end up becoming a millionaire because you lose so much money. And in the past 20 years that's been true, right? But now Buffett himself has bought all airline stocks, right? And look what's happening in India. You're seeing capacity being cut because so many of them are going bankrupt out of business. Kingfisher, Jet is on the ropes. And players who are surviving have increasingly good market share and some pricing power. You know, for example, a Delhi Bombay ticket used to cost a few thousand. Now it's like eight, nine thousand. So increasingly getting pricing power. And if fuel remains stable, and this is a business that you can't give in, you know, I mean, people will still fly for a holiday, for a social visit, for a lecture. So it's a great business. So I would be bullish on the airline business over the next five, 10 years, perhaps. Over defense, I think it's still nascent in India, so there's lots of opportunities. India has you know, got a long border with Pakistan, long border with China, so, and a long sea coast, so we'll always need defense. It has been restricted to the government of India or PSUs. It'll open up, so I think it presents a plethora of opportunities. I think both these sectors will do well. Okay, what about elections in the markets? You know, I mean, markets always get in a tizzy over elections out there, but I think history has proved somewhat otherwise. For example, when UPA government one came in, the market went down. And then what happened? The biggest bull run in Indian history started between 2003 and eight. When uh, Mr. Modi came to power, the market was very euphoric, 272 seats, first time in 30 years that a government has a majority. Market hasn't done that well as it did in 2004-9. So I think elections come and go. I mean, these are part and parcel. But the trajectory of this nation is in the right path. I mean, this 100 crore people that we have who are aspiring to a better middle class living creates immense opportunities for entrepreneurs. People who are on the straight and narrow, people who are focused on businesses, will find extraordinary opportunities in this country, which other countries don't have because they don't have the demographic base. I mean, for example, uh, US is growing, the population, working population is growing at about under 1%. So the economy is growing at 1, 2%. You know, but here we have undergrowing growth in our population. Even China is degrowing in terms of population now. So we'll grow at 7, 8%. We need to grow at 10, 12%, but we'll grow at least at 7, 8%. I think Gurchiran Das was an economist and he put it the best. He said, India grows at night. You do nothing as we grow at 7, 8%, right? We need a government that can take us to 10, 12%. Because here's what happens if you grow at 10, 12%. If you grow at about 10, 12%, every seven, eight years, you'll double the size of the economy. So if you are $2 trillion now, in seven years, you get to 4 trillion. 14 years, you get to 8 trillion. And in 21 years, you get to you know 40 trillion, whatever the amount works out to. That's what we need to do. I mean, that's what lifts us all from third world country to first world country. What about you, Ramesh? Were you a backbencher or were you right up front when you were in school? Uh, <laughs> Don't say you can't remember. <laughs> you were a backbencher. Let's ask some of the backbenchers questions then. Go ahead. Hi, sir. Uh, I believe it was Uday Kota who said that majority of the uh, balance sheets in the Indian companies are fudged. Uh, how does that exactly affect the market sentiment and especially the investors who are putting so much of time into their analysis and their researches? Doesn't it make it sort of a gamble for them? I mean, I hate to agree with Uday on this matter, but I think he's right. I think a lot of promoters have very, 
risky standards by which they make the balance sheet. And that's the first job that you do as an analyst, is to make sure that the accounting is straight. I'll tell you some basic things people do and they don't, you don't think through them. A young friend of mine bought me a company saying, I'm very bullish on this company, uncle. What do you think of this company? And so I ignored him, ignored him, because I had a suspect reputation for him. But then he finally pursued me. I got through the balance sheet. And here's what I found. Sales increased 30% from, say, 1,000 to 1,300. What did the receivers increase? Exactly 30%, down to the two paisa. So you know there's no cash flow being generated by the business. And he was just trying to manipulate receivers to show you a sales growth, right? So you have to watch out for the obvious tracks. Does he pay dividends? Because dividends are actually hard cash coming to you. Does he pay his taxes? If he's not paying his taxes, what is the reason? Is he under SEC or is he just not paying taxes? So there are lots of tests you can use. And more important, see the track record. If there's a five-year track record, a 10-year track record, then you'll find out that the business has grown 20%, 15%, 12% over long periods of time. But if just before an IPO has grown at 30%, I would suspect that. So one of your first jobs as an analyst is forensic accounting. You need to figure out if there's one thing I think you should study is accounting, because that's the language of business. So if you want to be an analyst, you better understand accounting, right? It's not very complicated, but you need to understand how accounting works, what loopholes people use. So I would strongly suggest that you, uh, you know, learn accounting and understand how people use accounts to manipulate their business figures. The stock price itself may not tell you much about a business, but the underlying business figures will tell you. You know, good companies have long track record. Before Infosys went public, you had a five, seven year history of company growing. You could go back and study how these companies build the business to the size they did. So companies that don't have a track record, I'd be a bit wary about investing there. Okay, and finally, Ramesh, if you could tell us where in this market you're finding opportunity sectors that you believe could lead. Well, you know, you look at new sectors. Uh, I think one sector which we've been very bullish about has been the gaming sector in India. If you look across Asia, for example, Japan, Singapore, Malaysia, Philippines, all have casino gambling available. So they're getting a lot of tourist inflows out there. India doesn't have it. They're very limited opportunity yet. But I think over the next few years, these opportunities will open up. Uh, there's a company based in Goa that does this. There may be a couple of other companies that do it. So the gaming sector. One sector that I'm very bullish on, Avan, is uh, the quick service restaurant business. Because increasingly, as more women work outside the home, as more uh, people want more hygienic stuff, you want AC, you want a restroom, and you want good, quick, fast food, I think these things will do well. There are not too many chains that participate in that. But I think some of the entrants, uh, you know, make pizzas, burgers, all of which are very popular food among all you people. So I think that uh, QSR will do well. Uh, I told you the move from unorganized to organized retailing will create a huge amount of opportunities. So some of the new places that look at Avan. All right, Ramesh. Thank you so much for joining in and enlightening all of our students. A big round of applause for Mr. Dhamani. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining in. And with that, it's a wrap on this leg of the show. Thanks so much for watching.